All right, if you are watching, I am getting myself organized. Hello everyone. I know that we're way later in the evening. Make sure you tell me if you can hear this because I need to know. And here I am. And we will click on this and come back to the chat box so I can see you guys. Okay, you can hear. So I'm near the sump. And that means there's going to be some noise. Uh, I don't know how bad it is. Feel free to tell me if it's horrible. <laughs> I uh, don't really, there's not much I can do right now. I have a thing I'm going to change the way the water flows into my sump. It's been on my list of things to do for three months. Eventually, I'll get, I will get to it. Today's uh, live stream is in the evening. I had to pick up family at the airport earlier today. And so now I'm back at the house. I was editing some videos for Reef Trace, the new app coming out November 1st. And then I thought, let me do a live stream, which will probably last about 30 minutes or until the battery goes dead on my laptop because I didn't plug in a power cord. The topic of manifolds are near and dear to me because they let you use one pump to run lots of reactors. And it's separate from the return pump. I want to start off that way. That's really important because some people want to use one pump to feed everything. And that's not good. And I'm ex I will explain why I don't recommend that. So if that's how yours is set up now, you might want to consider maybe making a change. All right, I'm still looking at your comments. I am not ignoring you. And I appreciate you guys even tuning in. I was thinking there's a lot of people that are gonna, going to be at Halloween parties tonight. But all of you that are not at the party, well, open up your favorite drink. And we'll have our own little party here online. Let's see. Okay, I want to show you my current manifold. So this is a live video. Look, my hand is in here. Yeah, live, live. And there are three valves here, plus a fourth one down low that I'll go into. And then this tube right here is part of my auto top off. So when it adds water to the system, water will flow down this tube into the sump. I'll show you all that stuff. Uh, but I want to show you, first of all, what I used in the past. So here is an example of a manifold I had on the sump over my 280-gallon reef uh, for about three or four years. And I'm positive you don't see any kind of mouse movement or anything like that over the screen. So I'm just going to point out there's a big, long, white pipe there. There are a bunch of downspouts and a bunch of red handles. That right there is a manifold. And I had a single pump that fed upward and then went across into that union and then to all those valves and each valve fed water to a certain area. Come back to your comments. All right. <laughs> Somebody <laughs> Someone said they're too old for a party. There is no such thing. Parties are awesome. Uh, let me see if I can get that thing off the screen that's covering up the words. It's been there too long. I'll change this to like 30 seconds instead of 300 seconds. Oh, hide now. Perfect. Okay, so as you look there, you'll see that there is a, you know, it's been so long since I set, you know, since I had that set up. I'm not entirely positive what each one fed. I can see one fed my sun coral tank, which is the black cube on the left next to the skimmer. One went to the calcium reactor. One went to the refugium to create some flow in there. And I've got a couple of other ones feeding something down below. It was probably one to feed calcium, uh, carbon, and uh, maybe just one extra for water changes or something. But that was a long, long time ago. And that tank leaked, and I had to replace it, and I had to switch it out. So I did something different on my 400 gallon. So let me show you that. Here is a close-up of a part of the manifold. Now, the difference you'll notice 
with this other manifold, the PVC is black and the valves are gray and uh, orange. And what we've got going on here is these are called uh, JF valves or John Fisher valves. And those orange handles are really easy to turn. You can buy them from Savco, S-A-V-K-O dot com. And it's an actual plumbing place in Ohio. I've been there once before. And it was kind of funny because, you know, it's a plumbing place. They sell plumbing for everyone. But what usually happens in the store is some guy shows up that has an aquarium. And he has all these weird things he wants to do. And it's all spread out across their countertop. <laughs> and, you know, these guys want to sell toilet valves and things. And here we are like, I've got to set up this reef tank a certain way. So Savco is well familiar with reef keepers and their demands. Now, the reason I like these valves better than the blue handle from Lowe's or the red handle from Home Depot is you can turn them really easily, where those other ones, they get really hard to twist. So I prefer these. Also, there is a couple of different fittings in the end there, the white fittings that are at a 90 degree angle. They're called hose barb fittings. And what they do is they can feed, you know, there's different sizes for different reactors. So one reactor needed 5 8 tubing. Another reactor needed half-inch tubing. Another one used quarter-inch tubing. I'll show you that here in a second. So there is another configuration that I ran with. And that was to feed my calcium reactor that uses quarter-inch tubing. And I ended up using RODI tubing because it was simple and clean and water safe. So while there's a big orange valve to cut off the water completely, that little valve is called a needle valve. And it lets me turn the knob gently and just a little tiny bit at a time to connect or to put in the perfect amount of flow into my calcium reactor. Basically what I need in the calcium reactor, and that's a video that's coming up in the near future, or you know, let's say in a month, <laughs> it won't be that near. Uh, that reactor needs very slow flow coming out of it. Some people set theirs up to drip. I have mine coming out at a steady trickle. And so I have to adjust that little tiny black knob from time to time. Right, I'm gonna come back here to me for a second and I'll come to your questions and see if anything's come up yet. Uh, someone asked, wasn't that uh, shown on the show tanked? And no Mondo, that was my 280 gallon reef at one point. Now, uh, tertiary adjunct says, rule number one, don't buy valves at Home Depot or Lowe's. <laughs> Sometimes you have to. And I prefer to buy my valves online if I can because I like that they're easier to use, they last forever, and they always twist. And that's really important because you're trying to adjust things. These are ball valves. There's also a valve called a gate valve. And a gate valve lets you turn a knob. And as you gradually turn it, basically there's a blade that comes down inside and covers the hole slowly. Where a ball valve uh, kind of does this number and just twists inside instead of just slowly closing off the gate. So I am talking about ball valves tonight before there's any confusion. Oh, well, it's possible you've seen those valves on tank, yes because they're great and you don't want to use cheaper valves, honestly, just because of use. Now let's go to my current manifold because this is actually new. I installed this one uh, just a few months ago because the previous one um, had to go. I switched out pumps. I had a dart pump that was feeding the manifold, which you saw a moment ago, the, other, the one with the black PVC pipe. And now I've got this one in here. Let's see if I've got to deal with the delays here and see what's going on. As a matter of fact, I'm going to have to switch camera views so I know what's going on. All right. <laughs> I saw that. No, I'm not getting room service. You're hilarious. So here is my valve, right? My uh, set of valves right here. And I'm going to move this so you can get a better angle. But you've got a tube right here. This one is running to my reactor full of carbon or granulated activated carbon, GAC. This one is running to the biopellet reactor. And then one in the very back is that little valve I told you about that does the quarter inch tubing, which you can kind of see right here, it's blue. That's going to my calcium reactor. Now I'm gonna move the camera to show you what is feeding this manifold, because I'm sure you're curious. Let's see, how about right there? So that's a Vectra L1 pump. And I installed that pump a few months ago and that pump feeds the manifold. And it also sends a leg way over there and feeds over into the anemone cube that is behind the wall. But, so that L1 pump is doing a great job of feeding three different reactors and an aquarium 
all by itself. And then the other pump I'm running, let's see if you can see it. Can you see that guy down there? That is the Abyss pump that I've been uh, running for, some, for a couple of months now as a test. And the Abyss pump has this black tube coming up, and that's what's totally in the way here. That's the line that feeds all the way up to the tank, and that's going up to the 400. So back to the manifold. As you can see, there is that little plaque valve that lets you tighten or loosen to adjust the flow rate. And of course, there's an orange, oh man, it's so hard to show you guys this. There's an orange valve back there that would let me just shut off the line entirely if I had to take that little valve off right there and clean it out. And then this valve over here, right here, oh, hang on, and get a good spot. This valve here is to control how much water goes to the, to the carbon. And I usually set that very slowly. It just barely trickles. And then this valve here is actually full wide open that's going to the biopellet reactor. And here are those two reactors right here, carbon and biopellets. And it's time to refill the biopellet reactor. It's almost empty. All right, so let me reset this back where it was and hopefully not knock everything down. <laughs> I'm sure I'm making you guys dizzy. Sorry about that. All right, let me come back to your questions and see if anything's come up. Uh, Reefing with O says, gate valves are better when you're really trying to fine tune, which I totally agree with. Um, for an overflow, a ball valve, well, you know, ball valves are going to be basically on and off and kind of on. And a gate valve will let you dial in the exact precise thing you want. Now, one person just asked, do I run a chiller? No, I've never run a chiller, and I'm here in Texas, and I'd keep my house comfortable so that I can be comfortable around my tank. If I had a chiller in the room, the back of the chiller would pump out heat, which would add more heat to the room and make me uncomfortable, and it's all about my comfort, so I want to be comfy. Now, um, one person asked what type of valve do you use for the effluent output, and I don't because I'm controlling the water going in with that little tiny ball valve, uh, gate valve, that needle valve, that's the word I'm looking for. So this one right here, let me switch the camera, sorry. This one right here is my needle valve, and that lets me dial in just by turning the knob slightly how much water comes out of the calcium reactor. And you can see the calcium reactor dripping out right there out of that blue tube. It's going down, and as there's more air, you can see the air bubble. That's actually just some air in the reactor coming out. It's trickling out of this hose right here. But then usually, if you look really close at the bottom, you might see where the water is trickling into the sump. There you go, that, that's a little bit better. So you can see I have a steady stream. I don't like to have it dripping out, I have a stream. Okay. Switch this back. <laughs> Brandon Zukowski wants to know what I'm wearing. <laughs> this is a shirt I got uh, from one of those nerd sites and it's Firefly and the Millennium Falcon and Star Trek, of course. So, all three. Now, back to the topic. When you're choosing what pump to feed your reactors, you have to know um, how many gallons per hour each item needs and combine them together. So if you have one pump that has to go through bio pellets and has to be 500 gallons an hour, and you have another reactor that needs 90 gallons an hour, so now you need 590, and then you have another item that needs you know, 200 gallons an hour, so you're looking at 6, 7, 90, plus there's restriction in the plumbing that reduces the flow rate so you might need a pump that does 950 gallons an hour, like a MAG 9.5 is a perfect example of that number. But most of us don't use MAG pumps these days. We're using DC pumps, we're using low voltage wherever possible to save on electricity and for longevity reasons and because it doesn't add heat. But what I was going to suggest to you is if you have a return pump now, get an identical one for your manifold. And the reason I say that is if your return pump fails, you can borrow the manifold pump and put it on your return pump and keep your tank running, because that's what matters most, is the living stuff inside. If you are using uh, different pumps, you can't swap it out, so you don't have that emergency backup that's ready to go. So I like to match the two pumps, and that's why I have two L1 pumps, one for the manifold and one for the reef. But it's just, not, the other one's not installed right now, because I'm doing the Abyss, um, I'm running the Abyss pump right now. The reason you don't use your regular return pump to feed your reactors, and that's something I said I was going to mention um, earlier, is because when you turn off the return pump like, like I do to feed your tank or to do a water change, when you turn it back on, it's going to blow water and air through everything you own. 
and it's going to send a big air bubble or burp right through your GFO, through your carbon, through your bio pellets, and none of those medias like to be burped with air. They're supposed to be kept, you know, wet and tumbling, but you don't want a big burst to send all that, you know, like GFO is metal fines or shavings of metal, right? You don't want that stuff burping into your system and ending all over the sump or ending up in the display tank where it can affect the fish. So I do recommend that you have a separate pump for the reactors, leave that running nonstop all the time, and then have your return pump that you can cycle on and off or slow down during feeding periods and speed back up. And then I want to mention I have this extra valve, and I haven't really used it yet. So I'm going to switch cameras again. I might as well show you one. I'm going to go off topic for a second. So this big container right here, this is my top-off container. And right now, it's pretty full. I mean, this is a block of water all the way up to, let's see, right here. That's the water line. There's the top of the box. I'm trying to keep this level for you. Sorry, I'm freehanding. And inside is a pump that pushes water up when I need to add water to the sump. And it comes out that tube back there, goes across, and then it goes into this little clear pipe that I got at Petco for like 99 cents. So my water line is this high. And if I ran that tube all the way down into my sump, then when the power turned off, it would just keep siphoning water out. So instead, what I did was I used this tube right here. So when it cycles the water on, I don't know if you can see. Let's see if I can get closer. Maybe that will, eh. yeah, you can kind of see it there. So you can see the tube stops inside and that is to break the siphon. So water trickles in, squirts down the pipe into the sump, all the way down. But there's no spatter, there's no mess. And when the pump turns off, it immediately back siphons out. It breaks the air right there because it's a tube inside a very large pipe. So that's my solution for topping off when you have a big tall container next to a very low sump way down here. All right? Now, I wanted to talk to you about these valves. Now, I have the three that I mentioned, calcium reactor, carbon, and then GFO. And then I've got this one down here. And this one feeds all the way across and across the front, and then comes here and elbows down into my refugium, but it doesn't actually touch the water. See, it's above the water line. And the reason I did that was so that I could occasionally put a cup under there and I could bleed the water out of the line right here that is sitting stagnant because it could be toxic. And I might change my mind on that later. I might open that valve slightly and let water trickle in here to blow water that direction across the refugium instead of um, letting it only come from that end this way. So instead I can actually send some back there, kind of like a closed loop. All right, let me put that down and I'll come back to your questions. Let's see, anything else? Feel free to ask me any questions at this point. That's pretty much what I wanted to cover. We still have some battery left. I'm going to give you probably about 10 more minutes of my time, then I'm going to get back to editing videos. Let me switch my camera back to me. Did I forget to mention anything in this reactor? Does, does this make sense to do the ball valves? I really feel like a manifold is such a nice way of cleaning up and not having three or four different pumps inside your sump feeding three or four reactors. Nancy asks, do you need all these different reactors? Are they even necessary? Well, bottom line is, if you just like changing water, you don't need reactors. But if you're like me and you don't like to change water very much, because I don't, <laughs> I'd rather have a reactor full of carbon. I'd like to have bio pellets to kill the nitrate. I'd like to have a calcium reactor to add the alkalinity and magnesium. I mean, yeah, and magnesium and uh, calcium. Mine does all three because I have some magnesium media inside there, which is super convenient. <laughs> G. Carroll asks why I didn't get a second abyss just for the reactors. Probably could blow the lid right off the reactor. That is a very powerful pump, so that's not going to happen. Captain Over asks, can you tell us more about Reef Trace? Reef Trace is a brand new app for iOS that comes out November 1st. So if you have an iPhone, then you're going to want this app because the app is going to include water testing and it's a really cool system. You know, we want you to test your water, obviously, and I've been telling you guys to do it every single week now for the last couple of months. Well, now with Reef Trace, you can do your water tests and then share your results instantly to social media, which would be super convenient. 
but you can actually do your test on top of your phone. Those guys, those of you that have the iPhone 6, the iPhone 7, you know, the iPhone 10 that's even more water resistant than ever, you can set it down on your table and uh, have the screen facing up and you can do your water test on top of a white background and compare it to a sliding scale to make sure that you're getting perfect lighting to see your, your test results. And that's a really neat feature that I, uh, I, I had some input on that idea. It's also going to have Critter ID built in. There's a plaza section that's going to tell you about things going on in the industry. You know, some of the sponsors of the uh, app will be promoting their various wares. Uh, Mila's Reef, of course, is a sponsor as well. And some of my articles will be included in there. And there's a local fish store locator that we, um, I say we because I'm a partner, but it, it, you know, I'm not doing all that work. I'm, I have my own stuff to do, but... The staff for the app actually called over 2,000 fish stores to make sure they're open and in business to make sure that it's accurate. And I'm told that with this app, you'll be able to report if a store no longer exists um, or to add a store. And if you're the store owner, you can actually you know, make it your own. So there's some really neat features right there. Also, um, well, that's the basics right there. The app is, as far as I know, is going to be $8.99. It's a one-time payment. You'll never pay anything else for it. You don't have to, like, add add-ons or anything like that. So that's exciting, and I can't wait to see it myself. Um, it's in production. I'm doing some videos about the, the tests themselves, the, the uh, water tests. I'm actually making the how-to videos that are in the app. So you'll be looking forward to that. Ray Baker asked, uh, why ball valves instead of gate valves? It's very, off, it's very um, unusual that you have to have that kind of precision for a reactor. You basically want to create a certain amount of flow through the reactor, and you can, you can eyeball that. But if you're running a UV or a chiller, and those items say you need 450 gallons an hour going through it, you would need more finer control. You would probably even need to um, maybe get the... Uh, the flow monitoring system from Apex, and now you could dial it in precisely. And then, yeah, you could use a gate valve. Big Bird EM asks, any experience with Kalkwasser reactors? Are they a waste? A Kalkwasser reactor is kind of a scary thing to me. And the reason for that is because, number one, Kalkwasser is scary to me. And I say scary in that I know what can possibly happen. Kalkwasser has a pH of 12. Our reef has a pH of 8 to 8.3. If a lot of caulkwasser goes in because of a mistake, you just put in a pH of 12 and you raise the pH in your tank very fast. And usually what happens is you end up with a milky, soupy tank and everything's dying and you're panicking. So FYI, if you ever have that happen to your tank, you can add white vinegar and you'll have to look up exactly how much per how many gallons. But if you know what that is and you, I don't know, make yourself a note and stick it next to the tank, in case of emergency, add you know three and a quarter teaspoons of white vinegar. I mean, I don't know. You know, whatever that number is, you need to know it. But because of that, I don't really trust it. Secondarily, Kalkwasser is really messy. So Kalkwasser reactors is supposed to make it where it's less messy. You can just go ahead and fill it up with some media, you know, the Kalkwasser powder. You add your, your water to it, which is typically going to be RODI water. And then there's a pump that stirs it up and creates a kind of a cloud. And then the cloud uh, settles, and then there's like this clear liquid between the mush on the bottom and the skin on the top, and you want the clear liquid to go into your tank. That's the premise. And so that would be what you'd want to do, but you really want to limit how much can go into your tank. And for me, that's just too risky. I would rather, if I was really going to do it, I'd rather do something like, let's say my tank needs one gallon every day. I would mix up a gallon and pour it in something that could, tr that could drip it in or dose it over the night until the jug is empty, and then you know repeat as necessary. I noticed at the Dallas World Aquarium, when they set up Kalkwasser, they have a five-gallon bucket sitting on top of a 1,500-gallon tank or a 1,200-gallon tank, and they mix up the solution, make sure it's clear, and then they open a little valve, and it just drips into the bucket is empty. And that's their daily routine because they don't use a calcium reactor. They're using Kalkwasser instead. Okay. Richard Favinger asks, can you tell us about your water change lines? Do you just pump into the sump? Actually, yes, I do. I pump water out of the sump, or I use gravity to drain it to the French drain, and the water exits the building, and then I open a valve that is plumbed to my uh, big water container behind the reef, and that 
has a pump on it and that pushes water into the sump until it's the right level and then I close it. And I do that occasionally, but it's really rare. Um, Rich Kapoor asks, bio pellets versus vinegar and vodka. What's your thoughts for nitrate control? I used vinegar and it, I'm sorry, that's not true. I used vodka and it took a long time for me to hit the right dose. I put in, you know, the exact amount you're supposed to put. You know, you start off with like two milliliters and then after a week you put in five milliliters and then you put in seven and a half milliliters and you're doing that every single day for a week and then you go up a fraction and you do that for a week and you go up a fraction and you do that for a week. And it took seven months to hit the magic number, which I think was something like 42 milliliters. And then all of a sudden my nitrates just dropped like a rock, which was great. But I had to be here to dose it. Now, you know, nowadays we have dosing pumps, but I also read about exact uh, accidents that happen and the dosing pump just keeps going. And if you had like a bottle of vodka next to your tank and a dosing pump and the dosing pump went nuts, it could just add the entire bottle to your tank. So... You know, I would want to do something like put in three days worth in a little tiny vial. So that way, if it sucked all of it dry, it's just three days worth and maybe my tank can rebound. It's, you know, it, it, it worked, yes. Vinegar, sugar, vodka, those work. But the bio pellets was more like 24-7. It's always happening. So much easier. Uh, that being said, my nitrates are up again. Uh, my bio pellet reactor is almost empty. And I just ordered some of those marine pure bricks. I'm going to put two of those bricks inside my sump and see if they work the magic that I've been hearing, because I'm very curious. And so why not? I have a tank full of nitrate. Let's find out. Uh, Exclusive Reef asked, if you're starting a new tank, would you go straight to a calcium reactor or a dosing pump? I'd go to a calcium reactor. Uh, I am so sick of dosing. I've got, you know, three-part solution on my frag system. It's just a 60-gallon tank. And I hate it. I hate having to keep mixing another batch. I hate that, you know, something goes wrong or that it's not dosing or I made a mistake uh, or the tubes are clogged. I, I just, ugh. I've done it for a year and a half and I hate it. I kind of knew I was going to hate it anyway, but I did it <laughs> for you guys. <laughs> and I hate it. I talked to, uh, to Marine Depot and said, you know, I need a calcium reactor for a calcium reactor video because I have one. It's this one right here. I'll show you guys my calcium reactor. So this is my calcium reactor right down here. And it's actually low. It needs media. And I'm going to fill it up with all those coral skeletons that we pulled out of my reef. Uh, I really can't really get you a better look at it. Look how dirty it is. I've had this calcium reactor since 2004. It's got a mag pump down there to create flow. Anyway, I'll explain how it all works. But this thing is filled with media. And I add CO2 that dissolves the media into liquid alkalinity and calcium. And that trickles into my sump 24 hours a day. And it's been, I've been running one of these things for, well, what did I say, 2004? So 13 years. I love it. So I'm going to set one up on the frag system just because it'll be way more stable. And I guarantee you that I'm going to have much healthier corals in there because my corals keep doing well and then going downhill as soon as I make a mistake. Uh... G. Carroll asked, are you using a dual stage regulator? Actually, I use the aquarium plants regulator, and that's going to be part of the next video. Mr. Reef Buster says, Milev, what's the best cleanup crew to battle turf algae? I have a ter terrible outbreak in my new nano tank. A nano tank, see, that's the challenge because you don't have room for a lot of critters. Uh, turf algae is the stuff that's really coarse and holds on tight. It could even be bryopsis, and you might need a product that kills it. Now, the latest thing that came to market was something that, you know, people have been talking about fluconazole, which is a medication for humans, I think. Might be for pets. Anyway, it's kind of a prescription thing as far as I know. But I just saw the Premium Aquatics is selling something, and I think they called it like Bryopsis Buster or something like that. So look that up. You'll find it. It's a bottle of, I think, 20 tablets of fluconazole. And you can use that. And so buy it now and add it to your tank and do the instructions. And it's going to take days. It's not going to be quick. It might take, you know, two, three weeks. But it should help kill the algae in your tank. Um, Jay Carey says, adding more colonies or letting it grow out? Uh, the reef itself has uh, colonies and it has frags. 
see, I'm, it, the tank's really blue right now. It's uh, 940 over here, so you probably can't see anything. I'm going to move this. Let me switch cameras again. Let's see if this works. It probably won't work. So there's a big light. Huh, that's not too bad. So you can see a chalice, and there is the sea bay anemone. There's the copper band right there. There is a very nice lithophylon. And over here, you can see there's a big yellow scroll. And, you know, it's so blue. You guys probably can't see anything. But there's a lot of growth happening. Like right there, that acro, dead center, the green one, there's about 30 tips bursting off of it. I mean, it's awesome. And the shadow caster right there has all kinds of new tips. All those white tips you see in the video, they're actually light blue. They're bursting off of it all over the place. It's actually really exciting to me. I'm, I'm very happy to see that kind of growth. And then this spot right here, that's a blue tort sitting on a patch of what was looked like dead skeleton, turned out to be a bunch of um, sunset monopora, and it's actually orange with green polyps now. It was completely bone white. I thought it was deadness, and I saw the, the white polyps moving. I was like, oh my goodness, that's actual uh, montipora. So that was really cool. Anyway, so that kind of gave you a peek of what's going on in the reef. Here's a, a lobo. But I'm sure this looks terrible. It's very blue. So. Come back to you guys. Um, switch this back. So anyway, one more time, just to show you manifolds, in case you need something very simple, all you do is use T-fittings and ball valves and a union to disconnect the entire assembly. And you can then, I mean, this was just pressed together with, you know, uh, PVC primer and PVC glue. And I do want, oh, let me go into one part here. Let me switch to this picture right here. This is a very important point. Those valves right there that I talked about, that I purchased, they are threaded. And the reason I chose thread instead of glued is so I could unscrew them if I had to clean them out. So that entire JF valve from Savco, the gray valve with the orange handle, you can completely unscrew it. I got the T-fittings, you know, out of PVC. It was slip, slip, of course, to glue it together. And then I glued in a reducer that was slip on the outside, threaded on the inside. And then I put what's called a nipple between the reducer and the JF valve. And... That way I can actually unscrew that entire valve to clean it out and make sure there's no obstructions in it. And when I took that entire manifold off my system after um, four years of use, there was hardly anything inside. I was actually really impressed. I thought there'd be a lot of growth in there, but that wasn't the case. And then of course the white angled fittings that you're looking at, those also unscrew for easy cleaning from time to time. Now with the, uh, the new setup that you saw, this is kind of a cool little quick story to wrap this up. I had everything in this picture. I had it all. I did not have to make a Home Depot run <laughs> to install this thing. I usually use black plumbing. That's the only thing is I had used white, but I already had it. So all this is white down here, but it kind of matches the white pump of the Vectra, which is what I'm using to feed it. I showed you guys this before. I'll show you to you one more time. There's the Vectra down there. Uh, and you see it's got white white pipe going into a white pump, so I thought it looked good. And, uh, but yeah, the valves were repurposed because they were threaded. I didn't have to sit there and buy new valves. It was awesome. And so I didn't waste any money. And I thought it was so cool that I could build this entire assembly without having to run to Home Depot for one fitting. I had it all because I have so much stuff stashed in my house. <laughs> all right, last question. Yes, Captain Over, I did talk about it. I, um, he asked, did you talk about the pros and cons of a dedicated manifold pump versus teeing off the return pump? I did, and so I'm not going to answer you again. When this video uploads, you can watch it later, but basically I recommend a second pump for your manifold and your main pump be your return pump. And I, I really recommend that they both be the same size pump if possible because that way if your return pump fails, you can borrow the manifold pump to get you through the night. All right, thank you so much. I'm going to go grab some dinner. I hope that you guys have a happy Halloween the next coming days. There's more videos coming. Reef Trace comes out November 1st, so there will be a live stream on that night as well. So there's going to be a stream in about three more days, right? And uh, that's everything for now. Have a great night, and uh, tell all your friends to watch this channel. <laughs> I'd appreciate it. Bye, guys.